Um, director, colleagues and students, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the third honorary lecture series. Uh, the series is part of the celebrations of Matthew's 68th year anniversary. Uh, the university has been organizing several activities um, as part of its celebrations and uh, you can get more information about them from our website and honorary lecture series is, is one of them. Uh, and today it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker, Professor Saskia Sassen. And um, I would like to also thank her for accepting our invitation. Uh, Saskia Sassen is uh, the Robert Lind Professor of Sociology, and she also chairs the Committee on Global Thought uh, at Columbia University. Her research focuses on globalization through emphasizing its impact on cities, immigration, and states in the world economy, with inequality, gendering, and digitization, three key variables running through her work. She is the author of eight books and the editor or co-editor of three books. Together, her authored books are translated in over 20 languages. She has received many awards and honors. Uh, among them is Prince, uh, Principe de Ostoria's Prize in the Social Sciences, which she received in 2013, and election to the Royal Academy of the Sciences of the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Sassan's work can be grouped under three major completed projects that comprised her 20 years of research. These projects en uh, engendered her three major books. Uh, the first one is The Mobility of Labor and Capital, her, her first book, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 1988. And there, in that book, her thesis is that foreign investment in less developed countries can actually raise the likelihood of immigration if that investment goes to labor-intensive sectors and or de uh, devastates the traditional economy. Um, her second book, um, a major book, The Global City, where she focused on New York, Tokyo, and London, uh, was published by Princeton University Press in 1991, and the ex uh, expanded edition uh, came out in 2001. And there, her thesis is that the global economy needs very specific territorial insertions, and that this need is sharpest in the case of highly globalized and digitized sectors such as finance. In the award-winning Territory Authority Rights from Medieval to Global Assemblage, uh, which was published in, uh, by Princeton University Press in 2006, she came up with this concept of denationalizing and focused on denationalizing dynamics. Her new book is Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy, which uh, was uh, published by Harvard University Press and came out in 2014. And in fact, her uh, talk today will uh, be based on that book. And um, uh, this basically constitutes the fourth major research project uh, of uh, Professor Sassan. The organizing thesis is that our global modernity is marked by systemic expulsions of all sorts, and so therefore we are now beyond simply more inequality, more poverty, more refugees in the global south. And she will elaborate on these themes uh, in her uh, talk. Her current writing focuses on two projects. One is Ungoverned Territories, which will come out uh, from Harvard University Press. And uh, this is the second book that is part of, his fourth, uh, of her fourth major research phase. And it uh, focuses on ambiguous jurisdictions that escape the grip of existing national and international institutions. The other is preparation, the publication of her Stores Lectures in Jurisprudence and Philosophy, delivered at the Yale University Law School in 2012. She is also involved in several projects, uh, one on mobilities, the other on the urban age, and also conventional governance systems and human security. So it's my great pleasure, pleasure to invite Professor Sassan to deliver her speech.
I feel very short <laughs> behind this huge podium. Uh, and I try to find, you know, I have a bit of housework to do. You know what I mean? My books. I brought three books, and I'm going to leave them here, and they probably will be forgotten, but there they are. And, uh, well, I am honored and I'm delighted uh, to have been invited to give this lecture. I have the highest regard for this university. It's a very well-known university worldwide, and it mixes very important forms of knowledge. Uh, so I want to thank all of those who are involved in that, the leadership of the university, and, um, and I look forward to staying in touch, really. Um, what I want to talk about a bit is, um, dear, hang on. See, I can barely see. I feel like pushing, this is part of the housework, pushing this podium a little forward, but that's not going to happen, right? It might just go over there. Um, I just, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, please, let's not, it's okay. <laughs> Um, so, so what I want to, to talk about is, um, is some set of questions that I, if we can push it a bit, that would not be bad, because I can really... <gasps> well, I would say thank you very, very much. Um, these are all distinguished professors. <laughs> <laughs> Here. And it's just a great beginning, a practical beginning. I'm Dutch, so we Dutch manage to informalize all situations. I am not sure that that's always good, by the way. But um, so, so I, I wanted to start by, by talking about questions of methodology. In my research, I have, um, even when I didn't want to, managed to always violate boundaries between systems of knowledge. And um, a bit exposed, I've come to understand that I have arranged for myself a zone, a zone of freedom, where I can uh, talk about, you know, use methodologies, describe critical elements, even if they don't fit the paradigm. And so I call that space before method. That sounds terribly elegant, wouldn't you say? And it lets me get by with murder, so to speak. So one, one particular zone of interest to me in my research is the weak parts of the paradigm. I'm much less interested in the center, the strong part of the paradigm. <coughs> I'm really keen on understanding what happens at the edges of the paradigm. As I say there, the fuzzy edges of the paradigm. Because that's where it gets mixed up. These are Creole zones, Creole mixed worlds. And, um, and so to keep on making it all sound elegant and serious, I call what I do. Did I just hear a little explosion? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody doesn't like what I'm talking about. Uh, I call it analytic tactics. So tactics, the tactical is always partial, right? It positions itself for convenience sake. That's the sort of a negative way of describing it. Now here are some of these tactics. First, in periods where you know, new meanings emerge and older meanings become a bit unstable, think in today's world, the middle class, the national state. Though maybe in Turkey it's a bit different than in the United States when one speaks about the national state. But the national state, in the case of the United States, is deeply imbricated with corporate global logics, you know, and, and your state probably much less so. But still, these are, the, the, again, the national economy, the national state, the middle classes. These are all categories that worked very, very well in particular periods, I would say, in the West. The, the decades after World War II. Beginning in the 1980s, these begin to lose their strength of meaning. They are less clear. So what I call for, what I do in my practice, is certain categories, I argue, need to be actively destabilized. 
not just destabilized in the broader world of conversation and writing, but I say as a practice, as an analytic tactic. Um, second, it's interesting to ask yourself, what don't I see when I invoke a strong category? It's almost an invitation not to think. So when you, th again, coming back to the familiar ones that I just mentioned, the middle class, the national state, when you invoke that, I mean, it's not that people stop to think and say, what does that mean? They don't. It's no knowledge, in that sense, an invitation not to think. Now, a subject that has always been of particular interest to me is a question of territory. And I... territory for me has been like a, a tool, a window that I can use in many, many different situations. I think of territory as a complex category with, that captures, if you want, embedded logics of power, which in our Western modernity takes its most accomplished form in the national liberal state, the working national liberal state. Um, and then also that category has embedded logics of claim making, which again in our Western modernity take their strongest form in citizenship, you know, modern citizenship. So my engagement with territory and my best book, <clears throat> I think a book that took me nine years to write, I did a few other things in between, but it was a long, long slog, uh, is about territory authority rights. And one of the efforts in that book <coughs> is to see what, what do I get to see historically if I use territory as my lens. That if, like in medieval times in Europe, European, Western European medieval times, a given territory was subject to multiple systems of rule. Authority systems were far more significant than territory. In our modernity today, Territory is the anchor, is the stuff, you know, that, that legitimates power, that enables power. So it's a very different thing. Now, I think that territory right now, given globalization, given all kinds of, uh, how shall I say, installations of the non-national in the national, I think in my reading, most of the global, what we call the global, gets constituted in the national, sub-nationally, really. Huh? So given all of that, my question is, shouldn't the category territory be freed up, analytically speaking, to serve, to capture, not just national sovereign territory, but all kinds of other emergent or existing territorial formations? So my work on the global city actually partly argues that the global city is partly, and these are partial conditions, a territory that exits partly the national, even though it is geographically speaking and in terms of land, earth, they're right there inserted in a na nation. But global cities of which there are about a hundred today that are, they are really partly global and partly national. They are neither fully national nor fully global. And to me they are like exhibit number one, there are many other exhibits, uh, of this proposition that I have already mentioned, which is that the global gets partly constituted inside the national. So, Territory, so right now, I, the, thank you for mentioning that, that's very kind. It reminds me of my deadline, I'm behind. So the book I'm writing now, which I call Ungoverned Territories, but ungoverned is a bit of an ironic take here, really does try to understand these formations 
Uh, and, and one image that I use for those of you who might be familiar with sort of older literatures, the notion of terra nullius, which were the lands during the imperial eras, which one didn't know very much about and didn't really care about. And so my question today is, are these ungoverned sites where I include dead land, dead water bodies, but I also include the digital space of global finance, which inserts itself partly in a national system, but cannot be fully controlled or governed by that national system. So, so the subtitle for my book really is The Terra Nullius of Today's Epoch. So this is a way to make territory work analytically, rather than just sitting there pretty as sovereign national territory. Um, now, <coughs> I want to to run you through a whole set of items that come from my new book, uh, and I'm going to frame them partially. This is not the framing in the book, this is just one of the framings. And it's the making of it all, an emphasis on making. So we make. And I don't mean the maker's movement, you know, where that's a little sort of a fashionable thing. I mean making, yeah? a, mater a material dimension to the issue, if you want. I love that. I think that is beautiful. Anyhow, this is less beautiful. We made this, the RLC destruction. The we here is clearly ambiguous, rhetorical, etc. But that's an accomplishment. We managed to destroy one of the biggest, if not the biggest, interior seas and reduce it to a sliver. We made that. So my question, clearly this is an ironic take, my question is, if we were able to make this, <laughs> can we make the opposite? Protect, enable, you know, the positive, if you want. Footnote, I'm using capability, this is my way of using it, not in the Amartya Sen sense, where it's sort of the term and the language in English is a bit that way. I don't know how it would be in Turkish, where the language itself, the word capability, has a kind of positive meaning embedded in it. This is to me forever a struggle with languages. I grew up in six languages, so I have this continuous echo in my head of how a word is constructed. I think it is truly problematic in English that capability has an exclusively positive meaning inserted in it. So I want to free the category capability up to argue that this is also a deployment of a capability, clearly highly complex, highly intermediated. Same thing about this. We managed to destroy in 20 years something that had been there for a million. That didn't fall ready-made from the sky, that destruction. That destruction was made. So from destruction to construction, you know, would be one way of framing the positive. Now, to organize some of these trends, we might ask, you know, what is that element that can make new orderings? Not change everything. History shows us very clearly that profound transformations can happen even if you do not change everything. You actually mostly change a few elements. So in that sense, what can make a new ordering? And sort of a more practical way that resonates with Western history, if you want, is to ask, what is the steam engine of our epoch? Now, the typical, or, or a more brutal way, what is in and what is out. Um, and, and again, if you think of the, the Industrial Revolution in England, um, the sheep on the meadow, if you had a plane to travel over England at that time, when the factories in the cities were churning out and using that wool. But what you would have seen is mostly a green landscape. And you would have said, what a nice rural economy this is. Whereas in fact, back to the sheep, that sheep on that green meadow was situated in a different circuit was not the prior circuit where the sheep was a key ingredient of the livelihood of the owner of the sheep, small farmers, 
which got everything out of it. No, that cheat now was already in the industrial circuit, but from the sky it didn't look that way. It was a nice green meadow and there were all those wonderful sheep. What a nice rural economy. But in fact it was no longer that. So, you know, th this sense of this intermediate period when the change is not totally evident, but it is in fact happening. Now, I argue that the steam engine of our epoch is uh, finance and really financialization. So finance is radically different from traditional banking. It's a mistake to confuse those two. Traditional bank sells something it has, money, for an interest. Finance sells something it does not have. And therein lies its danger. It has to invent brilliant instruments. That takes an effort. It's in fact the math of physicists. It's algorithmic math. Nothing to do with microeconomics. And it needs these instruments because it has to invade sectors. It has, over the last 25 years, developed instruments that can both financialize very, very recognizable positive values, like fancy buildings, and that which looks like it has almost zero value, like used car loans or very, very modest housing, mortgages on housing. So just to make it concrete, the back room of, say, Goldman Sachs, the back room in English refers to the space where the secretaries sit. Well, the back room in, in those financial firms today on Wall Street, or anywhere in the world, frankly, is full of physicists. We are talking the math of physics. These physicists develop brilliant instruments, absolutely brilliant stuff, to do what? And this is not their fault. This is what they are paid for to make rather brutal extractions. This is just one example of what I'm looking at through this lens of complexity and brutality in our current global economy. There are multiple such examples. The logistics of outsourcing. Brilliant stuff, brilliant engineering, planning, coordination. You mention it. To do what? To get access to cheaper workers, a bit cheaper. You have to stand back and say, this much brilliant engineering knowledge, logistics, planning, calculating the this, the that, how much can this ship carry, can we make a bigger ship for... To do what? So that, that is sort of the, the sharp contrast that I'm interested in. So with finance, the same thing. Brilliant instrument. I'm going to describe one of them to you. Took 16 brilliant complex steps, I saw it, for a very elementary extraction that left behind it destruction. So I think of finance, as opposed to traditional banking, as an extractive industry, just like mining. It extracts, and when it's done, poof, it leaves no zero interest in what's left behind once the extraction has happened. Now, that does create problems. So if you compare an economy, as was the case in the West after World War II, but already earlier in some countries, based on mass consumption, that means that every household, every individual's consumption matters. If that's the dominant ordering of a system, that makes a lot of difference. That means an expansion of middle classes, an expansion of housing for middle classes. And the, the notion is you expand, you expand, you expand. The more, the better. In an extractive industry, that's not the case. When you're done extracting, you're out of there. Zero interest. I mean, that is also the case with oil. That is why they say if a poor country discovers that it has oil, it's like a stamp of death because that everything is reduced to extracting the oil, which then concentrates anyhow, you know, the profits, the advantages. And when that is done, they leave, and not much is left behind. So, so I want to, to, to make that very, very strong differentiation between traditional banking and finance, because traditional banking is something we all need. We all need loans. 
for everything, to buy a bike, to, you know, to sort of whatever. So I have no problem with traditional banking, I have a severe problem with finance. Now I want to use this as an illustration. I have a, now here now I have to be reminded that I have to get down. I like to actually walk. <laughs> now this is all, yeah, okay. So look at this curve. Huh? 201, less than a trillion. Look how sharp it is. And here it is 62 trillion, six years later. That is jumping several orders of magnitude. That's not just simply a bit more. So this is very sharp. I have actually asked myself the question, can I find any other sector that has that almost vertical growth curve? No. Really not. I can't, I can't find that. Now, furthermore, when I see these numbers, this is a... This is an instrument that was certainly critical in the, in the crisis because it abused its own power, so to say, its own power of extraction, so left only uh, destruction behind. Uh, but it doesn't matter what the instrument is. What matters is that this is one element of finance. Now, when I see these numbers, my practice is to keep interrogating the numbers. I don't just say, take them sitting and say, oh, nice. So then I ask myself, well, these 62 trillion, what does that mean? You know, I need to, these 62 trillion, I mean, what is that? So for instance, if you compare it with global GDP of all the countries in the world at that time, which is 207, the crisis has taken off, but it's not quite, so it's actually an interesting year. It has not quite been fully destructive, let's say. Global GDP of all the countries, including China, etc., was 54 trillion at that point. So that's not difficult for, Banking or finance to go beyond, you know, it's not a, this is not exceptional. But then I ask myself, well, within finance, what do those 62 trillion actually mean? Well, the total value of finance at that time, 207, the crisis has already started. And the traditional measure, the standard measure is, uh, of, to measure finance, is finance as measured by outstanding derivatives. So it's a wobbly measure. But at that time, it was 620 trillion, which is like 10 times more than global GDP. That is a bit more than the usual. You understand? By the way, now finance is well over a quadrillion. So we know that many people are still not fully recovered, etc. Many of the new jobs are low wage jobs in the West, certainly. So that finance has kept on growing like that. It's, it's interesting. Now, to understand what it meant, again, back to that year, 620 trillion, what does that really mean? Because it's measured by outstanding derivatives, you know? That's not money, that's not cash. That is an instrument that stands for future values. So I said, well, let me check. What is actual money, as in currency, issued by the central banks, all the central banks in the world? That is a measure of money. That's not Bitcoin. That's not these alternative you know, paper currencies. That's just money as measured by a given country. And that, at that time, was about 250 trillion. So we know that something about finance is not about money. Now, I'm going to illustrate, uh, does this work? Ah, right. So this is just, this is, I'm sorry, this, let's just make this a footnote. When, uh, this is one instantiation of what I was saying. When Bernanke, the head of the Central Bank in the United States, stepped down in 2014, uh, in the middle of 2014, he gave a very beautiful speech. And he mentioned two elements, two elements that he said, and here are two conditions that we do not have much information about. And one of them, and that links to this financializing, was this. And this is the language he used. This is not my lefty language. Dark pools of finance. I mean, you know, that actually takes quite a bit for a central banker to use that language. They are supposed to have research institutions, as you know, and they're supposed to be on top of these things. Anyhow, he said up to 70% of financial trading in the United States is in dark pools 
and we do not really know what is happening there. You understand what I'm talking about? I say finance is it's just something, it is truly different from traditional banks. Now, I want to illustrate with a particular instrument the power of finance, the capacity of finance to invade any sector, and I want to show that it is extractive. And I'm going to use two extremes a very powerful financial instrument that involved the leading financials, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, several German and Austrian banks, etc. So we're not talking little things, we're not. It's, it's about using, not giving, extractive, it's about using uh, households, individuals that had not, that did not yet own a house. It was not about giving them the means to get a house. It was using them to get at the fact that the little house could be considered an asset. And the high investment circuits is beginning to ask in the 2000s when finance is just escalating in value, I say, you know what, give me some real stuff. Not an ask, not a derivative based on an interest rate, based on another derivative, you know, these chains. What was left in the United States at that point was about 30% of the households that did not own their house. The instrumentality was, ah, a mortgage. All we need is the signature. We tell them that they don't have to pay anything for five years at least. And we extract what we need. It takes us less than a year to do the extraction. I don't know if you're following me, but this is serious stuff. So, just to give you an idea, every one of these individuals who had to do this, they were the intermediaries, they had to get 500 of these contracts per week to make it work. 40 plus million contracts were signed that way in a period of less than 10 years, seven, eight years. We are talking significant numbers. 40 million households is up to 30 million people. I'm Dutch. My whole population of my country is 16 million. So it's like saying, you know, somebody, you know, from, okay. Well, so so um, the result of this extraction, every year for closures, because those people, they were not up to, you know, to pay. I mean, they, they had never thought they could own that. They were just forced because the intermediary said, I need 500 signed every week. So you can, you can sign, sign, you can have it. They were throwing it down their throats, as we say in English. Now, so the numbers you can see, and it goes on the first half of 2014, another half, in fact, I have the figures now for the end of 2014. It was over a million more. The second thing Bernanke, the head of the central bank, in the United States said, I, mean, I said that he said two things that he said we don't know very much about. The second one was this. And he said there's one thing we do know, that at least 40 million households will have lost their homes by the end of this year, this year being 2014. The figures come from the central bank, from our Fed, which is, as again, I repeat, the research institution. Now, Europe thinks it doesn't have this problem. It does. The worst case, the highest foreclosures are happening in Hungary, in Germany, in Spain, United Kingdom. You may have heard about Spain, but you probably didn't know that Germany is up there. Now, the numbers are much smaller. Again, these are households. These are not individuals. So, a household, you know, this could be up to 200,000 people or 400,000. Do you understand? If you think of a household of four. Hungary is the worst case. It has now a million households out. You understand what happens when, you know, at some point, you can live in there for a few years, and at some point you're out. You've lost everything. You started with little because otherwise you would not have signed on, and then you lose everything. Now, and you know these are the low ones, but this is like this is an instrument that can travel. Wait till it hits the middle classes in China and in India. 
think it's a bit too loud, this, could the tech change it? Um, so one outcome, one way of thinking about this is, wow, a lot of empty urban land. I mean, yeah, there are these houses standing empty. We now have areas in the United States where you have brand new houses and a lot of weeds. Why do I hear these bumps? I think it's just a bit too loud, maybe. Tech, maybe. <coughs> well. Uh, now, here's another mutation of urban land. This is something I'm also working on now, which is the buying of property. You can't buy urban land. It's very difficult to buy urban land. But you can easily buy property. And so this is something, this is, this has long, this is an old history in many ways. But that is changing now, as and this is a story that begins in 2008, basically, and after the crisis, in other words, when you see a real escalation in the buying of urban land. Now, here are some of these. I have a, I'm working with a data set of a uh, um, hundred, the hundred cities in the world, and they really cover the whole world, uh, where this kind of property buying is happening. We're talking corporate buying, minimum price five million, more or less. It varies a bit according to city, clearly. Uh, now, as you can see, New York, when it comes to mixing both national, I mean, when you include both national and foreign, New York is at the top. New York loves being number one, no matter whether it's positive or negative. Well, they got it. Second is London, and you can see the mix. Huh? So Paris, most Parisians, I was just in Paris, and most Parisians are absolutely not aware that this is happening. In New York, there's a bit of commentary about it. The Parisians, they can't believe it. And I, I, I did a bit of research on Paris, and it's a lot of Central Europeans. So I wrote a little piece for a newspaper. It just came out about a week ago. The Kazakhstanis, the Turkmenistanis, and the Parisians are in shock about well, the few that I talked with. They can't believe that this is happening. That this is, and this is another issue that interests me a lot. These sort of invisible histories that are installing themselves in these cities and how many people are not aware of. Anyhow, now here you get a bigger distribution. As you can see, a lot of the action is here. And then this line goes on and on and on. I'm actually enjoying walking here. <laughs> and on, and if I went in a way, it would go around 100. And then it sort of evens out, you know. It's, but it has an extraordinary mix of different cities and different places. And this is if you just look at foreign. So London there is at the top. Most of the investment, as you can see, is actually, you know, 29 versus above. You know, most of it is um, is is foreign. And and uh, people say, I love to tell the story. People often say, you know, well, it's gentrification, and it has elements of gentrification. You know, it's sort of a big property, brand new luxury replaces an older property. You can call that gentrification. But at the same time, I think it's a much deeper process. We don't really know exactly where this is going. And so one, one story that I like to mention is that in London right now, central London, the Qatari royals own more of central London than the Queen of England. You know, when you have that, that's not gentrification. Gentrification doesn't capture that other dimension that is happening. Now, footnote, the main owner of central London is neither of them. Huh? It's some duke, famous duke, who has sort of, I mean, he's dead, but, you know, his inheritors. And Paris, if you can see on foreign, ranks pretty much at the top. Uh, now, I just wanted to give you a few, a few things on London, because London is quite extreme. So there is something that is now called billionaire's row. This is, you know, sort of folkloric. So one third of the mansions on the most expensive stretch of London's billionaire row are standing empty. This tells you that this is not about, oh, I'm going to get myself a house in, uh, in London and I'm going to move in with my family. No, these are investments. So, you know, that already changes the character of it. So a Guardian investigation, he actually managed to, with this photographer, I just want to show you. So this is one of those properties. Now, you can tell that this, to get to this state, or to this, this much moth on your staircase, your luxury staircase, 
I mean, that takes quite a few years. Huh? Now, the most notorious, older, it's like almost an older phase of buying, are the Saudis. The Saudis own 12 properties. And they are, except for one, they're all, some of them have, like, I saw one has a tree growing inside of it, has made a hole through the roof. I mean, you know that nobody has been there for, you know, 20 years. Now, this is really an older app, okay? The Saudis are also, they're not your average investor. Uh, so this creates a kind of emptiness in the city. So the rich in London are even complaining, imagine. Now, back to the main subject. So one question that I really ask myself is whether we are confronting a kind of new systemics. On the one hand, vast amounts of money <laughs> concentrated in certain, you know, in certain formats, etc. And on the other hand, as we know, a growing mass of people is now even beginning to happen in, in China, etc. People who are actually poorer, who are, you know, who are losing income, losing ground. And here are, here's a graph that I have found very interesting, partly when I entered the whole debate about Greece a year ago, whether the Greek debt should be, etc. And when, when basically the argument in, in, in Europe was the Greeks are irresponsible, that is why they are in that problem. And I like this graph because it shows you that all these Europeans, including the, Ger the German, the red is German, they all hit some sort of rock bottom situation. There was a systemic transformation. Germany is one of the few that really manages to, you know, to rise out of it, though now it is also going down again, uh, because it has manufacturing. It has the ultimate manufacturing sector, which is machines that make other machines. The whole world needs them, and they're the best at it. They, along with uh, Japan and, you know, a few, the, and, and manufacturing, even that very high-level intermediate manufacturing, tends to be a distributed sector. It creates a lot of middle sector jobs. So you see a positive, uh, in terms of, this is GDP per capita, so a distributed effect through manufacturing. But all the other ones look. This was a systemic transformation that happened. And partly it has to do with the fact that the dominant sectors were extractive. They have extracted, so in fact, most, oh, Okay, I wanted to show you, that comes later, that most of these states, these governments, are poorer, including the German government. They are all poorer because they have been also been subjected to extraction. Now here, the, back to this notion of new systemics. So look at this. Here, so here is this, you know, this is just beneath that value, but it begins to, you know, this is where you see growth, and then the 80s. This is when I was beginning to work on my Global City book. The curve of returns goes up. This is the United States, maybe an extreme case. Then look at this. Then you have truly financialization. You know, we're talking the mid-1990s. Look at the sharp growth. Then comes the crisis, sharp loss. Now, for them, it lasted about two hours. Huh? <laughs> and after that, the returns, and if you, if you continue it, are higher than before the crisis. This is the critical point that after that it goes higher. And that, while most of the rest of the economy is actually losing ground. So this is a very important fact. And if you take this one, this is corporate assets. Same story, growth, look at the sharp growth. This already tells you, my God, there is a new dynamic that has installed itself in this system, right? Here the crisis lasts half an hour, and after that it just goes up, up, up. That diverges. This, so, so after World War II in the West, basically what grows is the big middle. That is what grows. Today what grows are the two edges. The middle is shrinking. The latest data for the United States, for instance, show that the middle class has shrunk. It has shrunk rather significantly. And this is official data. They undercount all kinds of things. Uh, now here is a graph that shows the, you know, that the states just to mention something, look at Germany. So Germany goes from a debt, government debt, a central government debt, 13%, my God, so reasonable. The United States was also pretty reasonable, if you look at it, 25. But look at that now, it's, where's Germany here? It's 44. That's quite a, that means that Germany thinks that it could do now in the 1980s, it cannot do today. So 
when I mention this notion of an extractive economy, it also reflects itself, I would argue, in the... This way. Now, these are famous graphs. I don't want to dwell too much on this. Uh, this is a hundred years of U.S. history, as I like to put it. This goes till the 2010 census. Uh, told in one line. I tell all my students, this graph you want engraved inside your head, not on your forehead, but inside your head. So this is when, uh, this is income share of top 10% of earners. And this is earnings, this is not inherited wealth. Which is very different, that would be much more extreme. This is, now, how they make what earnings means in the top 10% is quite different from what earnings means when you are poor and low income. But so here, look, they have 47%. Then comes the crash, right? And then comes this Keynesian period, where they lose quite a bit, and one can infer from this fall that other sectors gain. It doesn't show it, but you can infer it, right? And who gains? The middle classes and the strong working classes. They gain. When you read the literature of this period, for many of the Western countries, the notion is basically, now that we've got the formula to have a broad middle sector, we're never going to give it up. Well, before you knew it, 1980s, they were giving it up. Now, this is a mix. This is a success story, though, mind you, there were racisms, there were exclusions, there was poverty, but there was also a logic of expansion. It's mass consumption, mass production, mass construction of housing, etc. You know, it's, it's about expanding, expanding. That is the logic of the system. This logic that changes to extraction, as I was saying before, and, and uh, what you had here is policy and the actual structure of the economy. That structure of the economy is gone. The policy is also gone. But what I'm saying is that just bringing back policy in today's period would not necessarily give you this kind of positive return. It is a more complicated story. There is no easy formula. Because we, just that, that economic structure of mass construction of housing, mass construction of roads, if we took all the needs in the world for housing, for roads, for clean water, for its Actually, yeah, we would have that. But the COP that we just signed in Paris is not giving us that. So if we could only return to an economy where what we actually need done, then, you know, it would be an expanding economy again. It would mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are needed, a lot of workers, etc., etc. Now, I'm going to pass on uh, because I want to begin to, to conclude. I always bring a clock, but I always forget to look at it, so <laughs> I think I'm getting there, am I not? Yes. So, in the shadows of urbanization, this is another aspect of these expulsions that I study in this book, and um, this is about land grabs. So I'm going to do this very quickly. I think everybody is familiar with this. But the fact that in 2008, well, it really starts in 2006, and then it was mostly hedge funds and financial firms buying land. This is rural area. J.P. Morgan bought land in Russia. Uh, Goldman Sachs bought land in, in Ukraine that was before the war. So, you know, and, and the main buyers of land in sub-Saharan Africa for a period of six months in 2006, when this takes off, were hedge funds, which are highly innovative, uh, creative investors. And this is about money. Now, they were not buying land because they wanted to become farmers, clearly. They were buying land because it was an investment and so if you look at, this is the overall <coughs> figures, minimum, minimum acquisition is 200 hectares. Uh, so it's quite a bit, etc. I just want to run through this. Critical element, so much of it, most of it, except here, is for uh, crops, for, bio, <coughs> for biofuels, which means, <coughs> which means that they can use 
all the pesticides, all the fertilizers they want, in short, poison the land. And poison even the land that is beyond the plantation proper. You understand what we're talking about? This is just a rule, this is not mining. This is plantation economies. What is a plantation? Well, to have a plantation, you have to throw out faunas, floras, rural manufacturing districts, smallholder agriculture. And the smallholder agriculture, they know how to give the earth that they use that produces their goods a very long life. Plantation economy, zero interest in protecting the land. We know that. So not only are they grabbing land now in a very significant scale, pushing out millions, millions around the world, eh, people who wind up being flattened into the urban slum dweller, erasure, complete erasure of the kind of knowledge that they had about land, about how to protect the earth, you know, etc., etc., rotating crops, you know, etc., all of that, nothing. And, and a piece of history, which is their displacement, their expulsion, is sort of buried because suddenly all we see is the urban slum dweller, which is fine, you know, but still, it's an erasure of, of that knowledge economy, those cultures about the land, etc., etc. So to me, this is extremely serious stuff. And it is particularly serious when you see that, that um, that we're running, we're, we're in deep trouble around the environmental vector. I cannot develop that now. But say in the, mid, in the Midwest of the United States, which prides itself saying we are the basket, we are, what is it, the basket for the, the food basket for the world. Totally pretentious, but still that's how. Well, the earth is dying in the Midwest. The surface still looks green, you know, when it's meant to look green, it looks fertile because of so many fertilizers and pesticides. But the actual temperature of the earth is up, up, up. That means it's dying. It's just not visible. That, that it is dying is not visible. And here are all the areas that are in deep trouble when it comes to water and agriculture. The United States major. Uh, and, well, and yeah, I'm just going to, I wanted to, to just end with, with this. In a way, what I've been describing to you are a whole series of negatives. And they're negatives that, in many ways, devalue people. It doesn't matter, you know, 14 million households, that could be like 30 million people out of their homes and who knows where they are and what we have extracted. And this is the story really of extractive sectors. And um, we have growing inequality, we have blah, blah, and so, so I want to end with an image. Who are we the citizens? And I mean citizen in the broad substantive sense. We inhabitants of this world. We inhabitants of a city. Um, and show you this map. And I want to ask you who, this is in the public domain. These are all the agencies that are full time gathering data about all of us. And if your grandmother was having a nice cup of coffee, well, it would not be as nice as Turkish coffee. Somewhere in Manhattan, she's also in that data set. Huh? Everybody who goes through is in that data set. It's a massive, massive operation. One million plus people with top secret clearance. Conti everything gathering data, gathering data about all of us, everything, everything, everything. Now, who has seen, and those are the 10,000 buildings, more or less, that are where this is happening throughout the... Now, and it doesn't include Hawaii, which is, of course, where Mr. Snowden came out of. Um, who has seen this map? This is to me amazing. In the United States, it's the same thing, almost nobody. This map has been out in the public domain since 2010. The Washington Post, which is a very serious newspaper, put 16 of its top journalists to try to get the information. I have kept tracking it and say the last building that was finished, these buildings take years to build, um, was in, in Utah, Utah, whatever, in the west there, the biggest of them all. And, and so the logic of this system is that for, the way the system works, eh, is that for our security, we the citizens first need to be considered suspect. That's quite a logic. You understand? 
That's for our security. So to me, this suggests, this signals, a massive misalignment between the historic notion of the citizen, of membership, etc., and the question of national state security. Now, a, a, an extreme version of this misalignment is asymmetric war. When the national state today goes to war in the name of national security, it will produce urban insecurity. Because most wars are fought between, you know, irregular combatants, as they are called, and regular armies. That is, that, those are the two combat types of combatants. It's not like World War II when France fought Germany, fought Germany fought England, etc., etc., your regular states. Today, asymmetric war means that the city becomes a place for war, because for the irregular combatant, the city is a positive, because planes and big tanks cannot fully take care of the business of war. And we have seen that in Iraq. So the United States is now involved in its longest war ever. It cannot make an end to it, the war in Iraq. And the truth of the matter is that asymmetric war, this kind of war, means that there is no armistice possible. You don't have a hegemon, or a set of hegemons like you had after World War II, where they could sit around the table and say, OK, five years of war is enough. Let's go back to business. You don't have that option. Because forever, the irregular combatant can emerge. And so there is this complete a symmetry, if you want. And we, the citizens, frankly, are getting squeezed, you know, in this setting. So I am, I wanted to find, oh, so I'm just going to give you one more here. So this is, this is stuff that we have via Mr. Snowden, but it's in the public domain. So look at this, I love this. And I leave you, I, there's no conclusion, eh? So I'm just leaving you with this slide. So who's dangerous? This is secret, which now is in the public domain. Who's dangerous? Veterans. The United States government considers its own veterans, you know what a veteran is, right? Somebody who actually lost a leg, probably. Environmentalists. <laughs> Anyhow, who are we the citizens? Thank you very much. <laughs>talked about in the late 1980s about uh, two things in the economy that led to the finance finance becoming the steam engine of our economy one of them was structural change in the economy which I understand as technology the oh, other no, much more, it's much more than technology but, but anyhow right yes the other one was policies by governments and so on and so forth so what do you think the policies in the late 1980s and the early 90s and even after those periods. What do you think the government policies were in that period that affected, that made finance become the steam engine of our economy today? Well, I mean, I don't know what phone is on now here. I mean, phone. Okay, fine. So, I wouldn't put it the way you put it, you see. It's not that government policy made finance. I think that finance begins to emerge partly because of the digital movement. Because finance really, the business of financializing is much facilitated, you know, through digital infrastructure, etc. Um, and so what really happens is that it's the financial sector that is a sort of vanguard. And 
Then there are the corporations, who are the other strategic actors who also want to, you know, they have sort of exhausted the internal market in the United States, so they want to go global, etc. There is a lot of pressure to expand the opening of the United States. When the United States begins outsourcing, this is stuff that I did in my first book, outsourcing work in garment, electronic assemblage, in the 1960s. So this is something that people forget. They think it all started somehow in the 90s. No, because, but certain sectors which then enables the tigers, you know, in Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Korea. Uh, uh, so, so what happens is that as this economy evolves and assumes more complexity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, finance becomes this ultimate intermediary that everybody needs uh, in this sector. At that time, I, I would argue that this is stuff that I did in my territory book. I argue that that there's a big push, number one, very familiar stuff, on deregulation and uh, privatization. But here is where the state comes in. So when you privatize and deregulate in our types of democracies, whether prime ministerial or presidential, you actually hollow out parliaments and legislatures. And you hollow them out because oversight functions, etc., legislative functions, they don't disappear but they become private specialized services. You're actually enabling an intermediary. Uh, again, they can, they can rarely lose. You know, the ones that are intermediating between may go under, like mergers and acquisitions. A lot of lawyers and financiers made a lot of money, but many of those firms that they merged, they're finished, they're dead, they lost. So it's a very peculiar, again, extractive sector, as I would say. Now, the executive branch of government again, where the prime minister or presidential gains an ironic power. And it is a power that arises out of an alignment with finance and corporations. It begins to see. The United States is strong here. The, the England is strong. You know, some, some countries are stronger on this than others. But even, say, Paris, on, I mean, France, <coughs> under the socialist government uh, had Le Petit Bang, as they called it. You had the big bang in London, you deregulate, privatize, etc. So it's a, it's a combination of elements that positions the state in a peculiar way, because one part of the state loses. It happens to be the part where we, the citizens, have standing. We only have standing vis-a-vis -vis the legislative branch. We can call them up. We cannot call up the White House, neither the judiciary. So that is the one that goes out. It already leaves us in a bad place. But the executive branch of government takes over also some of those functions. It creates oversight uh, commissions inside the White House, in the case of the United States. Tony Blair, socialist, supposedly, had the cabinet that he had to have from the parliament, which was no power, and created an invented private cabinet, which was a real power, where he brought in the experts from the sectors. So it's a very weird situation. So when people speak about the state, I have a lot of trouble. That is why I call my book on the state, Territory Authority Rights, because it's really different combinations. Yeah? So the legislature where we are standing loses, which means that we lose to we the citizens. And the executive branch of government aligns itself comfortably with uh, the key powers. So, little point, and this is again a question to you. You can sit down. I think I've had some. Who has heard here of a private, uh, private uh, freedom of information request by Bloomberg News, a commercial entity of our central bank in the United States, the Fed, that it took the Fed two years and a half to respond to absolutely a no-no, this is not on. That make. And then when it came out, it came out very discreetly and it told the following story. <laughs> While we in the legislature, when the crisis hits, 2008, 2009, were debating, shall we pass on to the banking system, the financial system really, 320 billion dollars, citizens' money, huh? Uh, and it was a good debate, public debate. So I repeat, 320 billion. 
we found out from that freedom of information request that Bloomberg News put in that our central bank passed on to the global banking system, including German banks, but we're talking financial firms and we're not talking traditional banks, 7.7 .7 trillion secretly. How dirty is that? It's very dirty. Almost nobody knows that. The Financial Times on the front page where it did 21,000 plus requests for that money. This is, it's like that map that I showed you. It's in the public domain. All kinds of economists who should know, they don't know. I mean, do you realize what a government can get by with murder even if it puts it all in the public domain? I mean, this to me is also very disturbing, you know that. So the question of power, huh? who has the power, it's a, this is a very complex, multi-headed hydra. There are many, many elements. And, and uh, in plain view, what we call quantitative easing, which is about to hit Europe, or it is hitting Europe, it's another form of extraction. Now, in the United States, where 1.60% of all taxes came from corporations, today, Corporations account for about 25%. The rest is really citizens' money. Now, the way the government passes on what they're doing now in Europe to the government buys assets, supposedly, that have lost their value so that the banks don't suffer. You understand? So we, the citizens, are buying all kinds of junk. But hey, we're passing on. You know, now that we have quantitative easing, we still have, well, still have it. That's something like 20 or 30 billion a month, <laughs> our money. And we're cutting down on food stamps for the poor. I mean, and this is all in plain sight, you see. And, and it's so many different pieces. So anyhow, so when I, I say we can no longer speak about the state, we really have to say what particular sort of policy, body, etc. are we talking about? That was a very long <laughs> answer, right? being critical, real, realist, uh, critical realistic in that way, then I ask you what kind of alternative ways, ways of using time and territory uh, in this financial crisis uh, now? Do you see in the world alternative ways? Did, did I see in the world what? Alternative ways of using time and territory, like well, open source? Yeah. Can, can it be? Right. Uh, this is, you know, this is a multifaceted issue. Oh, I'm not supposed <laughs> to answer. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> regarding your last page, as a citizen, as an inhabitant of this world, do you have a similar list of yourself? Who or what is dangerous? Your list. Oh yeah, I have it. In brief. It's very short. <laughs> I talked about it for an hour. <laughs> so, so well, let me first answer this last question then. No, I think we, one of the, the arguments that I make in my new book, Expulsions, which I brought a copy of eh, for the for public library or whatever, all three books. Um, is that it's getting complicated out there. In other words, I don't buy quite the argument that, ah, the rich. 
know, we could get rid of all the rich and we would still have a lot of extractive modes in the negative sense. So I, I speak about predatory, predatory, very strong word, eh? grabbing formations, which include pieces of law, not a whole legal system, pieces of law, pieces of accounting, not a whole accounting system, pieces, which include certain corporations, which include certain instrumentalities of finance, not the whole of finance, so, and include particular individuals who are particularly brilliant and particularly predatory and who come up with brilliant ideas. Huh? So it's really, it's an assemblage of elements to say the corporation, most corporations, you know, are fine. The corporation is a very good concept. But we have, according to a German, recently, you know, the Germans are really <coughs> dead serious. So he found that 3,627, I know that number, I want you to remember it, <laughs> are the problem in the world. But you know, we have, we have, Millions of corporations. So to say the corporations is not enough either. The corporation is a brilliant innovation that keeps the inventor, the owner, from having full power over everything. It creates an intermediate sector, you know, of responsibility. So I'm not against corporations, but it is a few elements. So in that sense, it is really a messy situation. You have mixes of elements. So for instance, this shift corporations that I have been documenting for a decade or more, right? for, yeah, that uh, when, cor when, when two powerful corporations make a deal today to do business together, they have a clause in there, which is if there is a dispute, we're talking international eh? dispute, we are not going to a national court, we go to private arbitration. Now, private arbitration is a very sociological condition if there ever was one because they don't have an army. They are a limited number of highly regarded former judges, former heads of banks, whatever, and they make the evaluation. Now, I then, I, when, I, when I first picked up on this, which must have been 15 years ago, I asked one of my research assistants, I said, go find out, in, in the world that many at that point, what pieces of law they are using or are they making their own law? And she comes back to me. This is a beautiful story, actually. She was a very smart, but very, you know, most graduate students have a limited world within which they are doing their... This is, I was like that too, eh? I'm not, this is not a critique, this is just a fact of life. So she comes back and she says, but you know what? It is not private. 70% of these arbitrations use New York State commercial law. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Okay, New York State commercial law is a brilliant commercial law, you know, it starts with the, with the British Imperial and etc. What they're using is, they're using a public good, New York State commercial law, for which the citizens at that time put in a lot of money to support them, for a private negotiation. She made that confusion, she said they're using a public instrument, it must be public, hell no it isn't. You understand what I'm talking about, huh? So there is a kind of knowledge grabbing that is also part of the story, not just what I was saying as a piece of law, you know? So when you begin to really go digging into how this system works, it's a lot of stuff. But what was his question? <laughs> <laughs> or how to deal, right? So, yes, it's not if it were enough to shoot down all the rich. <laughs> hey, that would be simple. <laughs> if you really had the determined project, you know, but it's not simple. And so I don't have a clear answer, so I'm beginning to really go by modal in my politics and in my thinking, which is in my politics. I say, look, let's stop trying to tear down finance. It's too powerful and it will tear itself down. Let's focus our energies in relocalizing, you know, out with the franchise, and every franchise takes out consumption capacity from modest communities. So I have a whole set of, of uh, pieces of research that I've done, how you can relocalize stuff, so that the, the neighbor, I'm thinking about modest neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods, you know, they can do what they want, but, but the, the modest neighborhoods, because we have more and more neighborhoods that are not modest, 
you know, they were middle class, now they're not. So how to relocalize? I, I just, you know, so in that sense, my model. And the other thing is that at the level of research, I, uh, I really see two separate worlds in terms of the research. You know, one is this world that I was describing here. Another one for me has to do with what types of knowledge, what instrumentalities do we need to relocalize. And so I'm doing a lot of work on doctoral students, etc., on digital applications that can enable the life of low-income workers by making the neighborhood a social backup system. And, you know, this is just where I'm at. I don't have that many more years to live. I wish I had a lot more, but I don't. And, uh, and so this is where I am at in my own thinking, that, you know, power Historically speaking, has always brought itself down. So we might as well work on positive vectors, how to enable, uh, and and there are there, I have I could go on for a very long time on this. So I'm not going to. But local currencies, very partial, not not Bitcoin. But you avoid the credit card circuit, you, and you begin to. They're all first little steps in trajectories, you know, that strengthen. And again, I'm just focusing on very modest. And, and, but we are people around the world who are doing this, and there is a lot of connective tissue here. So that is not an answer to how do we change the system. But that is, however, historically speaking, uh, these are not unusual trajectories, you know. That when you think of, when you take a complex city, all the corporations that have existed in the past are likely to be dead. But the modest neighborhood are still there. And so, you know, that sort of gives you the thing. Okay. And that, no, oh, yeah. her. Yeah. Right. But the core, you said a few things, but at the core was what reminded me. I got totally carried away with this answer. So, no, just to be a basic question. Ah. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I got it. Digitalizing project. Uh, exactly. Important. That is part of it. But there are other things that are happening. So, so uh, both in the corporate world and in, in the, that other world that I am more interested in, in a way. So, in the corporate world, when these when these uh, corporations, what I was saying about the private arbitration. Sometimes a corporation decides, no, I'm saying we're moving back into a governmental jurisdiction. You know what that means? That means re-entering territory and re-entering slow time. So to me, what I have looked at is how the temporal variable is also used and deployed. Entering the state apparatus means entering standardized and slow time. Staying out of the arbitration, that works very fast. So, so you know, this, this is a question that has interested me a lot. Now, in terms of, of modest operations, etc., I think that what, what I see, at least in terms of the research that I'm doing, is, is that you have these new uh, geographies that are happening, geographies of mutual support, of solidarity, of mutual identification and recognition, you know. So you have really the more, the more modest operations, like you know, activists for immigrants, activists for this, for that. You have, a, I think, some very interesting uh, developments, and I see it. I mean, like the network of Filipino cleaning women who has set up a digital site where they are trying to enable uh, uh, trafficked women, Filipinas. It's all Filipinos, right? So you have multiple, 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 very partial, but with a, with a global projection often of these things happening. So one of the questions that I have is, where does this go? And, and to give you a simpler example is the human rights uh, vector. So for a while, coming up with the human rights regime was critical. But right now, when you exaggerate the human rights uh, perspective on a complex, messy issue, you also enter complicated terrain. So the challenge that I see for these good developments, these very particular geographies, is you know, how do we then 
also bring it back together, eh? because that's what the nation state did. The nation state historically brings together all kinds of elements that are disparate, separate, that could have gone many different, but it consolidates it around a set of issues. Right now that is not working because, for whatever, you know, growing inequality, all of those things. But, so I am a bit concerned. I'm both, both, both very impressed with all these partial networks, you know, that cut across boundaries that are very specific, that are getting stuff done, but at the same time it also concerns me. Because we're seeing also in the corporate world a set of very, very specific, a multiplication of very particular things. So, so just to give you an example, when Kyoto comes out, Kyoto contains, this is now, you know, like the prehistory, but Kyoto has a very specific set of propositions about construction companies. And, and Turkey, of course, has a lot of construction companies building around the world. So the biggest construction companies, supposedly, were going to have a lot of pressure on them to respect standards that include environmental protection, you know, all kinds. Tokyo, Kyoto actually had a very good set of propositions. So what happens, according to Günther Teutner, a legal scholar at the University of Frankfurt, they got together, the big ones, the really big ones, very, very limited number, and they said, this is going to be very expensive if we actually try to meet these standards. We're going to turn the table around. We're going to ask the governments that host our project and impose these, these criteria on us, we're going to ask them to show us where we are in violation. Do you understand? That is Machiavellian. You understand? In other words, say, government, you show me, big rich corporation, you poor government, show me, big rich corporation, where I'm in violation of Kyoto. We need ex expert lawyers on environmental, expert lawyers on Kyoto. Ex so that is a very visible moment, I mean simple visible moment, of some of these tactical moves, you know, that I'm sure we're going to have a whole series of them now with COP, COP 16 too. But so, you know, I see, I see a lot of these, these nodal moments that it's a variable. It can be good, but it can also get rather problematic, you know, this disassembling. So the absence of a strong national state, it, it can create, at least for a while, costs, new types of costs, because we're not ready with alternative, somewhat encompassing. And so I also make that argument with human rights. Just focusing on human rights, human rights, human rights violation can get messy when you have a larger context, you know, that, that kind of, so, so that is, I think, where we're at. So it's a bit of a disassembling, reassembling, and it's an unstable landscape in many ways. Okay. I think I answer enough questions. I give you almost a second lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, please join me thanking Professor.